So last Sunday, we focused on Wesley's first rule for a Christian's use of money, which you hopefully will recall was earn all you can. And that's everyone's favorite. I mean, who doesn't like hearing a preacher tell you God wants you to earn a lot of money? And of course, as we learned, there are limits to the all in earn all you can. It needs to be done in godly ways. It's not an anything goes sort of thing. And then, then we come this morning to the second rule. Save all you can. And we start to get a little bit nervous. What's this going to be about? Savings accounts pay next to nothing. And about investing in collectibles? Well, sorry, but your Beanie Baby collection has very little resale value. <laughs> that turned out to be a disappointing investment, even though they're all you know, in mint condition, right? Someone once said that no one wants to begin where we are. We'd like to begin where we'd be if we'd started when we should have started. The good news is it's never too late to begin saving. But like so many things in life, there can be foolishness as well as wisdom when it comes to saving. Homer and Langley Collier lived in a three-story brownstone on Fifth Avenue in Harlem. After college, they moved in when their parents moved out, and they never left. In 1947, they were found dead when someone reported a horrible smell coming from the house to the police. Now, the police couldn't get in through the front door because of mountains of junk piled behind it, so they had to climb in through a second-story window, and they found Homer slumped over in a chair. He'd been dead for several days, but they couldn't find Langley. Three weeks later, they found his rotting corpse crushed under the weight of hundreds of boxes. One of the booby traps he'd set to protect their possessions from those he feared were trying to break in and steal their stuff. The whole house was packed from wall to wall, floor to ceiling, with bundles, boxes, piles, everything from a wine press to a baby carriage, over 130 tons. Folks, that's 260,000 pounds of junk were hauled out. Decades of old newspapers, broken down furniture, the chassis of a Model T. <coughs> 14 pianos, two organs, and over 25,000 books. The house had deteriorated to the point that they had to tear it down. Now it's a park with a little monument, a little placard there telling about those brothers. Now, there is a profound difference in there between saving and hoarding. They, you know, they even have a TV show, or at least they used to, about hoarding. Jesus warned us about the sharp contrast between the values of the kingdom of God and the values of worldly culture. In Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, he said, Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth where moth and rust eat them, and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourself in heaven, yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy in his first letter, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 9. For men who set their hearts on being wealthy expose themselves to temptation. They fall into one of the world's traps and lay themselves open to all sorts of silly and wicked desires which are quite capable of utterly ruining and destroying their souls. For loving money leads, leads to all kinds of evil. 
And some men in the struggle to be rich have lost their faith and caused themselves untold agonies of mind. John Wesley instructed, having gained all you can by honest wisdom and unwary diligence, the second rule of Christian prudence is save all you can. Do not throw the precious talent into the sea. The mic go out? Yeah. You know, yeah. You know it gives us no warning all of a sudden. Okay. Can everybody hear me if I project, or do you want me to yeah, change the battery? It's fine. Okay. Yeah. The camera right. might not hear you. The camera will not hear me. Oh, okay. All right, well, I think there's a couple of spare batteries here, Scott. <laughs> All right, just talk amongst yourselves. belts right there and the clips right there. <laughs> you can hear me now, right? You can hear, can you hear me now? Right, I'll put this in my pocket and deal with it after this. <laughs> Alright, so John Wesley said, having gained all you can by honest wisdom and unwilly, unwearied diligence, the second rule of Christian prudence is save all you can. He says, do not throw the precious talent into the sea. Do not throw it away in idle expenses which is just the same as throwing it into the sea. Expend no part of it merely to gratify the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eye, or the pride of life. And Wesley went on to remind us that there's a difference between being a debtor and a steward. Debtors eventually have to repay what has been loaned to them but until that day comes, they can do with it whatever they want. A steward does not get to do with it what she or he wants, but rather what the master, the owner, wants. You and I do not have the ultimate right spiritually to dispose of anything we possess. But only God, the owner, according to His will. We're, we're stewards, you see, of our bodies, our speech, our time, our talents, and our money and stuff. All of which ultimately belong to God. In the 12th chapter of Luke's Gospel, beginning with the 15th verse, Jesus said, He said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. You know, have you ever seen that bumper sticker sign, The one who dies with the most toys wins? I always thought they're dead. How does that win? Anyway. Uh, then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? 
for I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up with tre treasures for themselves, and they are not rich toward God. Now did you notice as I was reading that how self-centered that guy was? It was all about him, right? I, my, It doesn't apply to any of us, does it? When Wesley spoke and when he wrote about how Christians should use money, there's one use that he, one word that he, he frequently used, and that was prudence. Proverbs 8.12 says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I have found knowledge and discretion. Now, prudence is, is not a word we commonly use in 2016, and there are lots of reasons for that. In this case, prudence is the wisdom to manage our money with the long view, far-sighted view, making wise decisions about how we use it now so it'll be available for the future. Now, that is a very counter-cultural view for a lot of people. We live in the culture of now, don't we? We want it all. We want it now. And this inability to take the long view and defer gratification leads too many people into living under an oppressive system of debt. When, when Barbara and I were overseas, the West Africans really did not understand. The Liberians had no working <coughs> understanding of the... Uh, whole concept of deferred gratification. If someone in your extended family or in your village had money, they were to share it with everybody else. So it got to the point where it was very difficult for them to accumulate capital or anything else like that in order to improve their life and the life of their family. In fact, there was a, a period of time when someone who worked for the church uh, was trying to accumulate enough money to buy a used Toyota, painted yellow, because all the taxis there were, were yellow, uh, and he got word that some members of his family were about to come and visit and probably weren't going to leave. So he brought all of the money that he'd saved thus far, gave it to Barbara and said, I need you to keep this for me. So that when they come and they ask, I can say, I don't have it. And that's their situation. Then we've got our situation where we don't like deferred gratification because we want the shiny, we want the new, we want the latest, and we want it now. And because we want it now, you know, over in West Africa, they really weren't able to get ahead. Over in uh, North America, we find ourselves getting behind because we start weighing ourselves down with all the debt. Put it on a credit card. Get an installment contract. As long as you can make the payments, you know, relax, eat, drink, be merry. Proverbs 13.11, Scott said, uh, as Scott read, says, Riches gotten quickly will dwindle, but those who acquire them gradually become wealthy. And the careful, far-sighted management of what we have to meet our needs while it grows to provide for us and bless others.
others in the future is frugality. And there's a difference between frugality and stinginess or being a cheapskate. Sometimes we make fun of people that are frugal. <clears throat> I used to kid the barbs dad threw nickels around like they were manhole covers. He was just a frugal, and, but he did well in terms of saving. I've, I've told you about the church that, that I led along the southern border of our state that tore itself up over racism leading to its eventful death. And, and that, that still is a painful memory uh, for me. Um, but it wasn't all bad because I met some really good, decent, faithful people in that church. One couple was always in a good mood when I saw them. And it surprised me when I learned they were the top givers in the church. Yeah, I sure wouldn't have figured it by looking at them. They had good, but average middle class jobs. One was in private industry, the other with the government. So I sat down to talk with them in their home, and it was a rather small red brick ranch house, probably built shortly after the end of World War II. And I learned that rather than move up to bigger and fancier homes and more prestigious subdivisions, they focused on paying off their mortgage early. They had that mortgage paid off for years. They drove used cars. And they paid cash for them. They had a couple of credit cards, because you gotta have a credit card in so many for so many things these days, but they always paid the bill in full every month. And they passed those values along to their children. Their, their, their daughter and their son went all the way through college. When the daughter went through nursing school, working and going to school, not borrowing money. They didn't have the money. They sat out, worked, got enough money to go on for the next semester. And they were very happy. They were extravagantly generous to the Lord through their church. They were prudent. They were frugal. They were faithful. 2009 Time Magazine had a cover article titled The New Frugality. This was just as we're coming out, you know, the, the Great Recession had probably hit its peak. The writer wrote, as we pick through the economic rubble, we may find that our riches have buried our treasures. Money does not buy happiness. Scripture asserts this. Research confirms it. Once you reach the median level of income, roughly $50,000 a year, wealth and contentment go their separate ways. And studies find that a millionaire is no more likely to be happy than someone earning one twentieth of that. A consumer culture invites <coughs> us to want more than we can ever have. A culture of thrift invites us to be grateful for whatever we can get. Now, saving all we can is challenging, especially in our culture that conditions us to expect to have it all, have it now, have it delivered, and ideally have someone else pay for it. But it can be done. You need a plan. What the Bible teaches us about money, about stuff, is it, it's not for the sake of getting more money for the church. It, it's, it's for the sake of saving <coughs> our souls. We need clear spiritual guidance about the use of our money and the accumulation of stuff because those can be such terrible sources of, of temptation for us. You know, we ought to have three books of our faith. First and foremost is the Bible. Second is the hymnal. You know, you really ought to have the hymnal at home. It's a great devotional guide. Even if you can't sing a leg, you can at least read the words. And guess what the third book of our faith ought to be? 
our checkbook. And those first two ought to be clearly visible when someone looks at the third. Because where we put our money does say a lot about our heart, doesn't it? That's what Jesus said. Where your money is, there your treasure will be. Now, one suggestion is, is what is called the 10-10-80 plan. First tenth, first ten percent to God through the church. Second ten percent invested, saved, set aside for the future. And then eighty percent to live on joyously and with gratitude. Now I know saying that that's going to require some repentance. And redirection, because remember, repentance is not just saying you're sorry. Repentance is, is admitting you made a mistake, you messed up, and then turning around and moving away from that mistake, away from that sin, to the right direction, into the right direction toward God. And that's going to be some of us, maybe a lot of us, are going to need to repent and redirect Financially, we need to face the facts. Where is it going? And for what? <clears throat> is it really worth it? We need to learn from the wisdom of others. You know, there, there are people out there whose advice can be trusted. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that have overcome some of the same mistakes we're making and can help us find the way out. Don't, we, none of us wants to be like that foolish builder that ends up not being able to finish the, product, uh, the project and everybody in, the, in town says, hey, there goes so-and-so. You know, Johnny Janey half-built. Simplify your spending. If, you know, again, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on the UMW. Please understand this. But if you regularly stock the rummage sale, sale with stuff because you bought more, newer, more expensive stuff, you might need to take a good, long, hard look into the financial mirror. Then do plastic surgery. If you're carrying balances on your credit card, stop carrying those credit cards. If you can't pay off the balance completely, don't use it. Someone said, you gave, gave me a great idea what to do with credit cards. You get, get yourself a bowl, put the credit card in the bottom, fill the bowl with water, put that bowl in the freezer. Then when you, when you think you're going to need to use that credit card, you're going to have to let that ice melt over time because if you try to zap it in the microwave, what are you going to do with the magnetic strip with the chip that's on the car? Huh? Pop goes the weasel, right? Gives you time to think about it. Not a bad plan. Or lock them up somewhere. You know, if you're going on vacation, you're going to need to have them around. But, you know, do plastic surgery. Kick the shopaholic addiction. Um, if you go shopping to feel better about yourself, to entertain yourself, that is a danger. Only shop for what you decided in advance you needed to buy. Don't be a grazer, be, be a hunter. You know what you're hunting for? See the game? Get the game? Take the game home. Make a list. And once you've got the things on your list, go home. You know, some of, the, some of those neat things, and I, and I fall and pray to them. I mean, they get me from time to time. All right, but those, those cute things that are hanging on those little racks 
uh, in, the, in the grocery store or by the checkout lane in, in, in the pharmacies and places like that, they, they've got us figured out. And one of the, I mean, years ago, a, a truth in advertising. I saw, I saw something and, and the, the company that manufactured that, their name was Impulse Marketing. <laughs> wow, that was so true. Uh, and then invest, invest in your future. We can't take it with us. But what we save can be used in ways that share the faith and the values we lived by. It might be interesting for you to read what Wesley said you know, about leaving uh, things for your kids after you're gone. Um, yeah, he said, you need to know. Is that, can your kids handle it? Or is that going to be a temptation for them? He said a lot more, but I'll let you read that on your own. Saving all that we can is a practical process. It's a very practical process along the journey of loving God with all our heart all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and loving others as we love ourselves and as we are loved by God. It's a very practical process that puts every area of our life under the gracious rule of God, the love of God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for all that you have given to us and for the love that continues to be showered upon us. Help us to reciprocate that love in very practical ways with how we earn and how we save that which you Allow us to provide for ourselves and for others. In Christ's name, amen. amen. <coughs>